Oh boy, this is going to be so much fun! Are you ready to begin our long journey into the world of stocks, corporations, businesses, publicly traded entities? Are you ready? I hope so, because this is the best part of the semester, in my humble opinion. Because stocks are where it's at, folks. If you're in it for the long term, and you don't want to be a real estate investor or start your own business, well, this is probably your best bet toward building substantial wealth. So let's get started on slide number one with our introduction to stocks and the stock market. You know, this is ostensibly Chapter 5 from the book, but Chapter 5 goes into far too much detail about things that are really not that important to the vast majority of investors. So again, if I were writing a an introduction to investments book, I would not have started with Chapter 5 in its, in its form, so I've rearranged it. So I call it our introduction to stocks. Is that good enough for you? I hope so. And we start with a quote from a comedian, a humorist, if you will, and a celebrity from the early part of the 20th century into the middle part of the 20th century, and that was Will Rogers. Now, most of you young folks have never heard of him, but he's the person who, who coined the phrase, he hasn't, he's never, there are no strangers, just friends he hasn't met yet. And he said, don't gamble. Take all your savings and buy some good stock and hold it till it goes up. And if it don't go up, don't buy it. Right. <laughs> you see, his generation was clobbered by the Great Recession, Great Depression, I'm sorry, the Great Depression, and the incredible run-up in the 1920s. Blue skies, productivity gains, a new era, the old way of valuing stocks are wrong. It doesn't end, folks. The dance continues. <laughs> That's capitalism, history of booms and busts and booms and busts. And do we ever really learn as a society? I don't think so. But the younger folks are a whole lot smarter than we were, that's for sure. So it's getting better, believe it or not, even with all the craziness going on. Slide number two. What are stocks? What are they? Well, I don't even like the word stocks. I like to, when I talk to people about, about investing, I say, you're investing in a business, in a corporation. And, and it, it's really, the word, the, the phrase is common stocks. But most people don't say common stocks. If, if, they're, if they say stocks, they mean common stocks. Uh, where did the term come, common stocks come from? Well, it came from, uh, it started actually a little earlier, but the 1600s were, was the big time as the uh as the uh the, the new world was being um uh colonized and, and and investigated and and explored uh these entities these enterprises needed capital they, that's a fancy word for money and individual shareholders would put up uh capital money and they would become shareholders in common every person who owned one share had one vote and if you had 10 shares, you had 10 votes. If you had 100 shares, that, that's how it works. So let's take a look. As we said, stocks represent ownership in a corporation. So you're part owner. And most all the corporations that we will deal with, in fact, all the ones we will deal with, and most all that you hear about are bona fide, which is a fancy word of saying real, they're not scams, uh, corporations that are in business to make money to provide a good or a service. And we call stocks equities, equities, because as we said, you're owner, you're a part owner. That's, that's, uh, that's what equity means, ownership. The, the, uh, the growth in stocks, I'm sorry, the investing in stocks enables investors to partip participate in the profits and growth generated by the business enterprise. So you can, even though you're just sitting on the sidelines watching the corporation do its thing, you can invest in that. And one of the things that we don't describe when we talk about stocks, but you would learn about in detail when you get to Business 120, Business 120 Introduction to, to Business, is that stockholders are limited liability owners. What does that mean? Well, 
you you only can lose your investment. If the corporation goes bankrupt and has debts, you know, from here to eternity, they can't come after you later on and say, well, you know what, this corporation owns us a lot of money, and you were one of the shareholders, you owe us. No, they are limited liability owners. Now, there are people... Some of them might become president someday. And and they have tried to use corporations as uh, veils, as a way to veil their assets, hide their assets. And the courts have a way to pierce the corporate veil. And and if 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 the if the person or persons are using the corporation as a way to, to uh hide their assets from from creditors and and you would learn more about this in a business 120 class or 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 a business uh, law class so so we won't go into that we're going to talk about real corporations that are that are in the business to make money and and do well for their shareholders and their customers and the society as a whole yeah stockholders receive as we learned in chapter one two wonderful things dividends and capital gains Dividends are optional payments of the earnings. They're under no obligation to do so, but some companies have been paying dividends for over 100 years. And then what we often think about when we think about stocks is the price going up, capital gains, capital appreciations. And contrary to what many people believe and how many people behave, stocks are not simply millions upon millions of worthless pieces of paper. No, the paper's all gone now. It's all electronic bits <laughs> that people trade every day. No, stocks represent ownership in real businesses, folks. If you buy one share of FedEx and that truck is, you see that FedEx truck driving down the street, you can go up to that truck and look at the left rear wheel and the one lug nut that's your part of FedEx because FedEx and Nike and IBM and GE and Apple uh, they're all very big corporations that are multinational so one share doesn't represent much of the business but that's a good thing isn't it yes the business has grown so we're part owners slide number three what has been the historical performance well, over the long term of modern finance, and, and we talk about the 1910s, 1920s, and there's some historical reasons for that, but you can go back further, you can start earlier. But we, if we start back around 1920s or so, we find that the stock market, as measured by the Standard & Poor's 500, which we'll discuss later on in this chapter, has averaged around 10 11%. It's actually done a little bit better, but I tell people 8 9 10 for the last 80, 90 years. <laughs> but in any one year, it is unlikely, folks, that you will get your 10, 11%. I mean, it, says it happens, but it's very rare. The return has varied from a high of 53.8% to a low of minus 43.4%. And 2008 returns was one of the worst at minus 38.5. As we said in Chapter 1, stocks are volatile. Has it gotten into your head yet? Yeah, it's not going to be peaches and cream every year, folks. There's going to be years that it's going to go down, and that's okay. In fact, that's good, huh? You younger folks want the market to go down, right? Because you're going to be buying shares over the next 30, 40 years. Think about that. Think about that when everybody's screaming and hollering and saying, Quick, the world's going to end. Get out of the stock market. It turns out that about every three years or so, every four years, there's a down market. Now, is it one, two, three up, and then one down? No, it never works that way, folks. I mean, every once in a while, but, but it might be eight years in a row or nine years in a row that it goes up, and then it goes down two or three years in a row. Who knows? From 1982 to 2000, the stock market went in two directions, up and way up. There were a couple hiccups in between. But then it went down three years in a row, 2000, 2001, and 2002. Yikes. Slide number four. And this graph is from Chapter 1, if you remember. And what we want you to key on is just what have stocks done. Look at the tremendous overperformance, outperformance re with the next category, bonds. Which are no grout, great slouches, folks. They've turned a dollar into 40000 but they haven't turned a dollar into $22 million. 
And then treasury bills, which is basically, you know, what you get from a bank or something like the short-term investments have done, you know, 5,000, not bad. While the consumer price index has gone up 20-fold and gold is done, you know, okay, a little bit, but you know, no, 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 gold. When people say, I want to invest in gold, I want to invest in gold, I show them this graph. And if they say, I want to invest in gold, I want to invest in gold, I say, go buy, go buy gold. Uh, I want stocks. I want growth. And and it, the numbers. It's just, I mean, how can you compare? It just it just it's out. It just it it's staggering that the difference. And why is it? Well, it just is common sense. If you stop and turn around and look at us ourselves, look at our society, and compare us to the way we were back in 1800. Go back and read historical novels from the time of the American Revolution and the time of Beethoven and Mozart and Napoleon. Go back and read historical novels from the 1600s or the, the Dark Ages and you will see that our standard of living is, is unparalleled. Never in the history of the world have we been so wealthy and so well off. We have a long way to go because there's still many people in the world who are not sharing in that prosperity. And I know that might sound like some liberal, bleeding heart thing to say. No, 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 you don't understand. Those are potential clients. Those are customers. Those are people who want to buy Nike shoes and Colgate toothpaste and Marlboro cigarettes. And they want to have cell phones. And, and they want to watch Disney flicks. <laughs> yeah. This is a phenomenal opportunity for investors over the next 20, 30 years. And we'll see. And I, might, I probably won't be around to see it, but you, many of you, will be. And I hope you will be pleasantly surprised and look back over the last 20, 30 years and remember what Piano told you and say, you know what? The goofball was right. We're better off than we were 20, 30 years ago. And 20, 30 years ago, we were off. We were doing pretty well. We'll see. You know, there could be a nuclear war, or we could die on our own waste, or the global warming. You know, not enough worms to go uh, warming. I'm sorry. Or, or who knows? Meteorite, uh, uh, a tsunami, Ebola becomes all the rage. Disco returns. And you younger folks don't, you snicker at that, but you didn't live through the 70s. They were a tough time. It was disco. It was, it was tough. So I'm optimistic, and I hope you will instill some of that optimism in yourselves and make some money over the next 20, 30 years. Because look at the rolling 10-year period returns on slide number five. Now, what is this? Well, what we're doing is we're taking a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, yet another index, which we'll describe later on in this, in this chapter, measures uh, this, it's supposed to be, a, a, the, it's the, certainly the most popular measurement of the stock market. It's not the best, certainly. The S&P 500 is much better, but this is a popular Dow Jones Industrial Average. And what we see are 10-year returns. In other words, from 1928 to 1937. From 1929 to 1938, you, you, 10 year periods. How did we do? And so you go back to the Great Depression and you see we had 10 year periods where the market was down. Yeah, uh, or just barely uh, uh, zero. That was the Great Depression. You put your money in the stock market and went on a deserted island for 10 years and came back and you lost money. But then coming out of the Depression, coming out of World War II, in the 1950s and 1960s, science and technology, and that's where I got my name, Wonder Professor, because it was Mr. Wonder, and, and, and we're going to have the atomic age, and everybody's going to be wealthy, and everybody's going to not work. Your, the, uh, the, there will be no work. There will be leisure worlds, because the machines will do all of it for us. And the stock market went in two directions, up and way up, and you had almost 20% returns over 10 years. And everybody said, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Because they hadn't touched the stock market since the Great Depression because their granddaddy lost everything. And, you know, when you hear people saying, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? You know what the answer is, don't you? 
Yeah, it's it's too late to get in, right? Because then we had the 1970s, and you didn't believe me, but it was a tough time, folks. We had Watergate, and the Vietnam War, and the oil shocks, and inflation. But what was the real problem in the 1970s? Well, it was twofold for the stock market. First of all, stocks were really, really high. And secondly, we had the baby boom generation coming of age. Because it all gets back to demographics, folks, which is a fancy way of saying the population. Economics always gets back to the population that it serves. The economy always reflects what's going on in the population. And the population was ex exploded in the 1950s and 60s with the baby boom generation. You might have heard that term. A baby boomer is in charge. The previous president was a baby boomer, and the president, two presidents before that were all baby boomers. And so we're on our way out. I'm one of them. <laughs> and you saw the stock market just barely touch zero. It didn't hit zero, but it almost didn't go negative, but it almost hit zero. And then we came out of that time with the 1980s and globalization and new technologies. And the baby boom generation was assimilated and the baby bust, that was the Gen Xers, are coming up. And you see we had the market go in two directions, up and way up in the 1980s and 1990s. And again, you had almost 20% return on your stocks. And you, I'm sorry, back here, what did people say? I forgot to tell you. What did people say back here? Ooh, 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 is it too late to get out? <laughs> and when you hear that, Right. The answer is yes. It's too late to get out. Now's the time to get in. Because here we are in the 1980s and 90s, and technology and blue skies and productivity gains, and machines are going to do everything for us. The internet, the, the telecommunications, and you heard people in 1999 and 19, 2000 saying, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Um, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I think you're seeing a pattern here, aren't you? Uh, yeah, it was too late to get in. In fact, Stocks were really high, and we had the internet bubble, and then we kind of burst that, and we thought, well, we got to get rich somehow, so then we had the housing bubble, and, and that didn't turn out so well, did it? And so here we are, folks, here, well, no, we were here 10 years, almost 10 years ago, in the Great Recession, and you have to go back to the Great Depression to see rolling 10-year periods where you lost stock, money in stocks over 10 years. Yes, and then what do you hear people saying? Ooh, is it too late to get out? Yeah, it's too late to get out, folks. Now's the time to to put your money in because look what's happening now. Ooh, 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 does that mean we're going to go back up to 20? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think so, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean we're not going to crash again. And the future, that's why they call it the future. If we knew what was going to happen, we wouldn't call it the future. We would call it the past. But I think it's very optimistic. I believe that I'm hoping that we're going to level off, that we're going to find that happy medium and be able to bring millions of people around the world out of poverty and into the capitalist consumer society so that they have clean water and, 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 and clean food and healthy food and clothing and housing and, of course, Internet access, got to have that. And can cell phones and, uh, and some kind of means of transportation, whether that's a car or a bicycle or who knows, a hyperloop. Yeah, sounds like an ad, doesn't it? But I'm very optimistic, as I've said over and over again. And I'm certainly putting my money where my mouth is. We're still, my wife and I are still heavily invested in stocks, even though we are a little older than most. Uh, we're not 100% stocks, but we're pretty darn close. Uh, we should have a whole lot more bonds at our age, but we don't because I'm not a big fan of bonds right now. I think they're too darn expensive. And uh, I ain't going anywhere soon. I ain't retiring. I still got another five years. Who knows longer if I can make it. So we'll see. Uh, I'm a lot older than... I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I look a lot older than I am, but I'm older than most people think I am because... Whatever. I'm, I'm blithering. My apologies. Slide number six. Historical performance continued. Traditionally, close to half of the return from stocks was from reinvested dividends. You see, stockholders used to expect 4 to 6% in dividends each year. That was as much or more than bonds returned in interest since stocks were considered much riskier than bonds. So if you go back to 1936 and then fast forward to 2008, the S&P 500 dividend average was almost 4%, 3.8%. But then in the 1980s and 1990s, 
dividends fell to less than 2%, and for many companies, even 1%. Capital gains and growth were what people wanted in the 1990s. Don't give me dividends. No, no, no. Take that money and reinvest it back into the company because we want the company to grow. We want capital gains. And so from 1997 to 2007, the S&P 500 only averaged 1.5% in dividends. Hmm. Now, what were the reasons given? Well, they were varied. Uh, dividends were taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. Well, this was true until 2003, and now they're taxed at the same rate as capital gains, which is a much better rate. And this has been a tremendous um, boon for, for the people who invest in the stock market, which are typically more wealthy people. Uh, people wanted the business to reinvest the earnings for growth instead of distributing it to the investors, as we said. Well, sure, capital gains are cool. It's fun to see your 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 account go up in value. People believe that stocks were no longer considered riskier than bonds. Well, they, they learned about that in 2000 and 2002 and then 2008, didn't they? Savings accounts were paying less than 2%. Well, sure, you can't get very much at the bank, so why not put your money in stocks? And people lost track of their senses and bid up the prices. Well, there's something to be said for that, too. <laughs> Ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Okay, so slide number seven. What are we looking at here? What is this? Well, this graph is going back to 1960 and showing us that the yield on bonds was, uh, this is, I think, the 10-year treasury bond, yeah, 10-year treasury bond, uh, United States government, versus the yield on the standard and poor's 500, how much stocks are paying us if you owned all 500 companies in the Standard & Poor's 500. And it turns out that the yield on bonds was really not that much higher than the yield on stocks. But as we went through the 1970s, we see the yield on bonds skyrocketing. Why? Because inflation took hold. And it turns out inflation is a nightmare for bondholders. And so they kept expecting higher and higher yield. And stocks did, didn't, did not do well in the 70s, so this, the yield spiked. The price went down, the yield went up. We're going to see that relationship when we get the bonds. And sure enough, stocks were paying pretty darn well, but not like bonds. And then the Federal Reserve Bank, under Paul Volcker, decided, you know what, we got to kill inflation. And uh, it was uh, President Jimmy Carter. I know you have a hard time believing you younger folks that we had a president named Jimmy. And to his credit, he said to Mr. Volcker, he said, look, we've got to break the back of inflation. And Mr. Volcker said, yes, we can do it, Mr. President, but it may cost you your election in 1980. And to his credit, Mr. Mr. Carter said, that's not important. What's important is what's important for the country. And he did lose the election. He also uh, got caught up in an Iran uh, uh, hostage affair, which really hurt his presidency. And then what happened is Mr. Volcker and the Federal Reserve cranked up short-term interest rates which broke the back of inflation, caused a serious recession. And you see bond yields starting to fall and fall and fall as inflation fell and fell. And then you see the stock market responding with the baby boom generation coming of age and, and being assimilated and new technology and, and computers and telecommunications and the Internet and p people bidding up the prices and stocks going up in one direction, up and way up, and the dividend falling because prices are a whole lot more. And we finally hit 2000 when the dividend yield hit 1% for the Standard & Poor's 500, and people were saying, Ooh, is it too late to get in? Uh, yeah, it's too late to get in, because <laughs> then we see the dividend starting to rise. Why? Because prices are falling. And we can still continue to see the, the, uh, the, the bond yields going down, because inflation just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then in 2008, what happened? Right. The organic matter hit the ventilating device. You heard people say, ooh, is it too late to get out? The yield on stocks went up to 3% because the price went down. And the yield on bonds plummeted. Why? Because inflation disappeared. In fact, we had deflation. Prices fell in 2008 and nine. Why? Mostly because of wages, right? And housing falling in half in some parts of the country. You had to go back to the Great Depression to see real estate fall more than 50%. And that's exactly what happened in some areas like Chula Vista. <laughs> and that's usually, but not always, a great sign for stocks. And sure enough, stocks roared back. The dividend fell. 
the 10 the 10 year went up to about 3 point something rather and then again fell again and this and the yield on the stocks went higher than the dividend than the, than the yield on bonds in 2012 again that's a good sign 2013 was a great year for stocks 30% oh by the way when people talk about the first year of of um uh Trump's uh first year of Trump's presidency being so wonderful the stock market the first year Obama's was better. Shh, don't tell your Republican friends. They get upset when you say that. Anyway, so what are we, where are we now? We see the yield on the 10-year Treasury and the yield on the stock market, S&P 500, very close to one another. Very close to one another. Now, what should we see in the future? I don't know. I'm expecting bond yields to go up, and so is the rest of the world, and we've been expecting that for several years, and it hasn't happened, but all of a sudden it seems to be happening now. So we'll see what happens. But again, as I said, I'm optimistic about the stocks in general. If we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own waste, have a nuclear war, such and such. Slide number eight. The pendulum swings, dear students. The bear markets of 2000 and 2002 and then 2008 have changed investors' perceptions about dividends. We now see investors and companies focusing more and more attention on dividends. Many companies that never paid dividends in the past aren't doing so now. Many tech companies are no longer growth stocks. They are mature industries and they are drowning in cash. Microsoft, Google, Apple, they've got tens of billions of dollars in cash sitting around. And finally, I forget what year it was, 2004, 2003 or so, Microsoft had $60 billion sitting in cash. I mean, how many times can they rewrite Word? They can't get it right. They rewrite. They keep writing, rewriting Windows, and every time it gets worse. And if you, any Windows fans out there, I apologize, but it's the truth, isn't it? Come on, don't don't lie to me. I mean, it, it, it's getting worse, not better. At least my experience is that. I'm trying to go to Google Docs. Everything I do is Google Docs, except the presentations, because of the certain thing about Google Docs that doesn't work right. Anyway, the tax law has changed dividends so that they are taxed roughly the same as capital gains. So do we like dividends? Yes, we do. Oh, by the way, Microsoft turned around and paid a huge dividend and has been paying dividends ever since. Apple is now paying dividends. Google is now paying dividends. Yes. And I love the title of this book. The book's not that great. Uh, it's called uh, Dividends Don't Lie by Geraldine Weiss. And she was in La Jolla. I'm not sure if she's still around, but she was based in La Jolla. And she liked dividends. And I like dividends. Dividends don't lie. What, do you, what does that mean? Folks, you're going to see later on in the semester these uh, in, uh, financial statements, cash flow statement, the, uh, the income statement, the, uh, the, the, net, the balance sheet. And all those numbers could be total lies as far as you're concerned because you don't work there and you don't see what's going on. The one number you know is not a lie is the dividends. That's the one number you know is not a lie. Why? Because they sent you a check. Well, they don't send you a check anymore. It comes, it comes electronically into your account. But still, you dividends don't lie. They had to have that money to pay you. And then there's another statement I like, but it's probably, he didn't actually say it. It was said by his neighbor. But do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure? It's to see my dividends coming in. Supposedly, John D. Rockefeller told his neighbor that. But... um I like it. It's a great, you know, I just the only thing that gives me pleasure is to see my dividends coming in. He probably did say it, but the na we're up to, we, we have to rely on the neighbor's uh, integrity to know if it's actually true or not. So slide number nine, to recap, what are the pros and cons of stock ownership? Well, investing in stocks allows us, the general public, to share in the rewards of the business enterprise. We can be part owners of Walmart or Costco or JCPenney's or Target. If we're really into retail, if we love shopping, we probably know what are the cool stores and we might want to invest in those. We can be owners of GM or Ford or Honda or Toyota or BMW. So we can be part owners if we know the, the world of uh, automotives well. Mm -hmm, you see? Or whatever, you're in the world of healthcare. You know what companies are doing well, what companies are not doing well. You can be part owners of those companies. And they have been the best financial investment returns over time, giving us dividends and capital gains. 
Now, have they beaten real estate? Well, that's a, it's, it, it's not easy to, 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 uh, to compare apples to apples because they're not. They're apples and kumquats. Or, and real estate is a whole different world and how we invest in real estate is very different and we'll discuss that later on. But stocks have beaten bonds. They've beaten uh, short-term investments. Yeah, they've done the best in the financial world. They're easy to buy and sell. They're a very liquid investment assuming you buy bona fide corporations. Fancy word for saying real companies that are not scams. We talked about the limited liability. And again, we'll make mention that this system, capitalism, might be just the worst system ever created to produce and distribute goods and services to uh, people. Except for all the others. <laughs> How's that working out for you in Venezuela these days? Oh, not so good. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so, so yeah. When something better comes along, hey, fly it up the flagpole. See if it, see if people salute. But until then, this is what we have, and and it's worked, not imperfectly. Yes, imperfectly. But you, again, I want you to go back and read some historical novels from the Middle Ages or or from the 1600s or 1500s, the Renaissance, and find that ye, ye, we got a pretty good life, folks. Let's hope this system doesn't work. Let's do our best to make it work. Failure is not an option. What are the cons? Well, you got to put up with the risk. You got to put up with the volatility. It ain't going to go up in a straight line. It's going to be a roller coaster. And once we learn how to deal with that intellectually and emotionally, we can use it to our advantage. We know these times are going to come and when they come and everybody's running around screaming, is it too late to get out? That's when we put our money in. And when everybody's running around and screaming, is it too late to get in? That's when we prepare ourselves for what comes next. <laughs> we don't get out because we don't know when it's going to happen. It might happen now. It might happen two years from now. You don't know. But you have to be prepared so that you don't panic. And then we're going to discuss some of the hanky-panky, travesoras, trucos, all the tricks and gimmicks and uh, other ways that people try to game the system and steal from the, because that's where the money is. Yeah, we'll discuss that in detail. So here we take a look at a graph that I call volatility examined, slide number 10. And this is the Standard & Poor's 500 for the year 2017, which was a very good year, folks. Uh, not the best, but very good. And so we see at the beginning it jumped. And, you, and you're sitting there, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And it jumps again. Oh, my goodness, it's up so much 7.5% in just a couple of months. So you put your money in, right? Only to see it fall 4%. Or three three percent or so, and you go, ooh, I don't know, I don't know. I take my money out, and then it jumps again, and you go, okay, all right, I'll put it in, leave it, and it dob dips, <laughs> and then you take it out and you put it in, and then it does okay, and then does okay, and then it dips again, and you take your money out here in August, and you say, I'm never going to get back in the in the stock market again, and then it goes wee up in the air. Oh, we're going to discuss market timing, folks. And all I can say from my personal experience and from whatever I've, whatever I've seen and read and talked to people and the experts, don't try to do it, folks. Don't. You're never, you're never going to. You, you'll hear people say, oh, it could go up 30%. Oh, it could go down 30%. They're right. It could go up 30%. It could go down 30%. It could go up 100%. It could go down 100%. I don't think it's going to go down 100%. It can't go down 110%. It could do a lot of things. But what it's going to do, we don't know. And nobody knows. Unless you have some incredibly powerful position, such as you're the uh, chairperson of the Federal Reserve Bank, and you get the rest of the chair people to, to collude with you, and then you could throw the, the whole thing into a tizzy and make money off the downturn. But let's just hope we don't get any people in the Federal Reserve Bank who are like the person in the White House who would do that in a heartbeat. So... Um, a gratuitous shot. There you have it. Uh, so, folks, thank you for being with us. Go back and review all this. Make sure you understand what we discussed because this is very important. This chapter and the next are, are of, of, of utmost importance, and we want you to be awesome. We want you to know what you're talking about. We want you to speak with authority, and you are going to be the investment guru for your friends and family 
and they are going to be so amazed, so amazed and astounded at your knowledge. Is that cool? Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Now, on our next presentation, we will discuss where stocks are sold. How does it work? What is the relationship of brokers and dealers and market makers? And and how does this whole thing work? What's going on behind the scenes, behind that uh, uh, internet account you have with Schwab or, or TD uh, Meritrade? Okay? Study hard, bring honor and glory to Southwestern Community College, and be awesome, dear students.